Thank you very much. Um, and thanks so much for making an effort to include me, even though I'm not physically there. I'm very sorry not to be physically there, but as you may be able to hear from my voice, not only have I had COVID, but it's actually uh, it's actually impacted me. Uh, so this has not been symptomless um, and my voice is kind of not quite where it should be. So I apologize if I'm not my usual um, chipper self and I might not be quite as sharp as I usually am, but hopefully uh, I'll be okay. So as Raphael said, I'm a philosopher rather than a lawyer, though law is something that is never far from my work. Some of you might know my paper, uh, for example, Should We Protect Animals from Hate Speech, which I see as a kind of straightforward philosophy of law paper. Um, and today I want to talk about my forthcoming book project, which again was just mentioned, which is called Food, Justice and Animals Feeding the World Respectfully. And this is a book that, again, law is very much present because it's a book about what kinds of things the state should be preventing. It's a book about what kinds of things the state should be endorsing and what it means to endorse in politics and in law, right? In what ways the state can get involved with the food system, in what ways the state uh, can encourage certain aspects of the food system, support certain aspects of the food system. It's a work of what in political philosophy we call ideal theory. And that means that it's engaged in the question of just system design, rather than answering those questions of so-called non-ideal theory, or perhaps we might say pragmatism, about how we get there, about how we improve our current system. Now, I do do a lot of that work, but the question I'm interested in, in this project and in this presentation, in a sentence, is if animals have rights, what does the food system of the state look like? What does the food system of an animal rights respecting state look like? And then attached to that, what kinds of laws, institutions, norms should be created, should be fostered to support, encourage, permit to for the state to interact with the food system? I hope that's not too abstract. Um, it's a fairly, I think, crucial. Well, it's a very important question. It's a fairly foundational question about what the future of human animal relationships looks like. And the punchline, uh, my one line summary is that it won't be a vegan state, right? That's my, that's my claim. I'm a vegan. Uh, I believe many of you will be vegans as well. I've spent a lot of time arguing for veganism, but I actually think that the food system of a just animal rights respecting state would be a non-vegan food system. If you like, we can have our cow and we can eat her too. We can respect animal rights, but we can still have access to those animal-based foods that many of us value. So what's going on here? Well, much of the book is given over to exploring what the food system uh, would look like, what kinds of rights-respecting sources of animal-based foods we might have or we could uh, have. But I think what's really important to lay the foundations of this project, and this is what I do in the early chapters of the book, is to set out what's wrong with a plant-based food system, or if you like, what the trouble with veganism is. And again, this is not about individual diets. This is about the problem with a plant-based food system. Okay. My intellectual foundations, if you like, come from two um, I believe complementary, some people might think they're conflicting, but two uh, different directions. The first of these is liberal political theory. The second of these is animal rights theory. OK, so my my picture is a liberal animal rights theory. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the work of, say, Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicker, and that will give you uh, Zoopolis, the, their book, 2011 book, and that will give you a flavour of the kind of thing I'm pointing towards. Now, let me be quite clear. I don't actually agree wholeheartedly with, with uh, Donaldson and Kimlicker's approach, but in terms of a rough outline, I think that gives a good indication of what it means to wed liberal political theory and animal rights. But from both the perspective of liberal political theory and the perspective of animal rights, there are reasons for us to be worried about a plant-based food system. Why? Well, I think there are four, four broad kind of concerns, two from each of these theoretical foundations. When it comes to liberal theory, I think there's a real concern when it comes to the issue of diverse conceptions of the good. Now, those of you who know a little bit about liberal theory will be very familiar with this idea. Central to liberalism, central to many political theories, but certainly central to liberalism, is the idea that humans are 
um, many different individuals who have many different views about what it means to live well. Okay, so say uh, perhaps a Christian political theory of certain kinds or a Marxist political theory will say, well, this is what it means for, to live a good human life. The liberal says, hmm, I think what it means to live a good human life is up to the individual human. Now, that doesn't mean anything goes. That doesn't mean you're allowed to do whatever you want, whenever you want, because that might be what uh, your conception of the good says. But what it does mean is that many we need to take seriously the fact that many people um, seek the good life, have plans for their life that involve working with animals, that involve working with animal products, that involve uh, interacting with people in ways that rely upon animal products, right? For many people, particular animal foods might be central to their relationships with their family members, with their spouses, with their friends. For many people, particular animal foods might be central to their um, religious or cultural festivities or identities even. Work with animals might be good life-defining work. Their conception of the countryside, the, you know, the vision that they have of their nation, the vision that they have of the natural environment might be one that involves animal farms. Now, again, I am not saying that this means we can override animal rights. I am an animal rights theorist in, in the political tradition, and I believe that animal rights are a matter of justice. OK, you can't just ignore them just because it would be nice if we could. But but. This idea points to a limit of a vegan food system and suggests that if we could have a non-vegan food system that still respected animal rights, that would be a good thing. Of course, I've not said what that is yet, but that's, that's, that's the project. So second concern, again, from liberal theory, is the issue of food justice, okay? This is a broad term. It means a lot of different things, and we could go into that in great detail if people are interested. But roughly, I mean that Many people may struggle to access food, may struggle to control their food ways, their food systems, may struggle to find good work with food, may struggle to find food that is appropriate to their cultural understandings. It's a slightly different kind of concern because it's uh, to the previous one because it's more about communities than and than uh, individual conceptions of the good. If a, uh, a plant-based food system is imposed upon them. OK, we can think about uh, food security issues. We can think about the fact that uh, meat, for example, is a nutrient dense food, which is very, very useful when it comes to people who maybe do not have access to large amounts of food, whether that is in the global north or the global south. I'm not going to say any more about that, but hopefully I think you, you understand the worry here. Let me come to the slightly more surprising side. Why on earth would a plant based system raise problems from an animal rights perspective? Well, I think there are two broad sets of concerns. And again, this speaks very strongly to my interest in working out uh, sources of animal based food which are respectful of animal rights. The first of these is what has been called by myself and others uh, new omnivore arguments. New omnivore arguments in a sentence are arguments that there are certain ways of producing animal based foods that may be much more animal friendly than standard methods of plant based food production. Um, a vivid example of this is the fact that driving a combine harvester through a field is not very good for the animals who live in that field. Nonetheless, there may be sources of animal based food, um, and we'll see lots of these uh, over, the, over the next few minutes in the presentation, um, that are much more friendly to rights bearing animals. And then finally, and this is something I borrow directly from the kind of zoo political approach I was just talking about, one of the advantages one of the advantages of zoopolitical approaches to animal rights, in contrast to abolitionist, extinctionist approaches, uh, you know, made famous by, by Gary Francioni and others, um, is that this finds a place for animals. But what I think is really striking is when you start to sit down and read Zoopolis and you say, well, what's the place for farmed animals? There's not much, right? Some people might choose to live with a cow. Some communities, these, these are examples from uh, Donaldson and Kimlicker, uh, if they, you know, if they have a farm. Um, some communities may choose to live with sheep to keep um, grass short around solar panels, right? I mean, that, that might sound like quite a niche example, but that's the example that Donaldson and Kimlicker use. But basically, there doesn't seem to be much of a home for um, these newly liberated animals. Could we imagine an alternative system in which these animals lived with us, among us, and helped us to produce food? a system in which animals are food workers, 
but not um, food themselves, not mere stock. It's a farming system without slaughterhouses. I'll get back to that in a second. Okay, so that's the kind of foundational, those are the foundational worries. That's a very quick whistle top tour of, of an opening of the opening chapter. So what I'd like to do for the remainder of my time, I've got about 10 minutes left, is talk you through some of the um, ideas that I'm exploring, some of the possibilities um, that I'm exploring of food system, of um, elements of a food system that could be respected. Sorry, I'll start that again. I'd like to talk you through some of the elements of a possible food system that would respect animal rights, yet nonetheless be non-vegan. Okay. The first of these is invertebrates. Now, what I mean when I say invertebrates specifically is I mean animals who may or may not be sentient. I'm a sentientist. I believe that there is something special about sentience. Sentience I define roughly as the capacity to feel pain, or I define more technically, and I do a bit of technical groundwork in this chapter, I define more technically as the capacity to have valenced experience. Okay, I think the word sentience actually gets used to me a few important, importantly different things. And I think there's something special about sentience. I think that sentience is the foundation of rights, and I think that if we have non-human animals who are non-sentient, they are potentially fair game. In fact, I think they are fair game. Because I believe that what I'm talking about here is sentient rights, not animal rights. And I don't believe that sentience is completely coextensive with the, cap uh, with the kingdom animalia. So a very easy case, conceptually speaking here, a very easy case is the invertebrates who are probably sentient, right? These are animals who maybe aren't sentient, but they, they probably are. We, we should just treat them as if they're sentient. We should give them rights, even if we're not absolutely sure. We, of course, have something similar going on with humans um, who are um, may or may not be alive, may or may not be sentient, etc. We also have a very conceptually easy case when it comes to non-sentient invertebrates, those invertebrates who are definitely not sentient. Now, identifying a real world example of these is quite tricky. In the invertebrate welfare literature, jellyfish are used as an example. Now you might think that's not very helpful for my project, but actually jellyfish are, are very much edible. Right there, they are eaten in Thailand, they're eaten in China, they're eaten in Japan. So yeah, um, jellyfish are very much edible and you know are fair game insofar as they are non-sentient. I think uh, a case more familiar, as this picture indicates to many of us uh, in this room, is the case of oysters. I, I, I don't think there's very good any particularly good reason to believe that oysters are sentient, and I think that they are probably fair game. Now, you might say, well, what does it matter? Why, why is it so important that we can eat these animals? If there's a chance, a tiny chance they might be sentient, uh, we shouldn't be eating them. And I would again point you to what I talked about earlier. And I think oysters are a wonderful example of this because oysters are a great example of an animal that we can farm very, very sustainably. Um, and indeed, so sustainably that it has a positive impact on local environments a lot of the time. They're filter feeders, they clean out waterways. They've also been used as uh, tide defences, which is very interesting. So these are animals who it might be better for us to farm than not farm. Of course, the difficult case comes in those vast majority of cases where we're just not quite sure about the sentience of these beings. And I Again, these, these are kind of my assessments as someone who is a, a non-specialist when it comes to invertebrate welfare, but someone who has spent a lot of time reading this literature. My, my example of this middle category of insects, right? We need some kind of middle ground. It seems wrong to say that these animals should be given all the rights of an animal who is definitely sentient, but then it also seems wrong to say that they're completely fair game. And that's, that's the hard question. Um, I'll just go through this slide very quickly. I think it's also really interesting to think about developments that take plant-based foods closer and closer and closer and closer to meat or to other um, animal-based foods. Now, these might seem quite innocuous, but I've actually spent a lot of time uh, thinking through these puzzles and, and engaging with uh, the challenges to them. And there seem to be two sets of challenges. The first comes from a kind of vegan critical theory perspective, and it says there may be something disrespectful in replicating meat. Um, we should instead be trying to move away from the idea that meat is food. And then on the other hand, uh, a challenge that often comes from advocates of, of slaughter-based meat, they might, we might say that this is bad food because it's processed, it's unnatural, it's unhealthy. Okay, 
I think a more important element of this this food system I'm envisaging, because you might think, oh, well, plant based meats here, it's it's not it's not particularly novel. It's not, you know, it's vegan. Um, a more interesting, important foundation is cellular agriculture, including especially cultivated meat. Many of you may be familiar with this, but I have a few chapters where I explore this over the course of the book. I'm very much an advocate of cultivated meat in this ideal theoretic lens. OK, and I accept that there are questions we can raise about the way that the cultivated meat industry is moving today. And again, that's one of the important distinctions between exploring ideal theory and non-ideal theory. I think those problems can be overcome, incidentally. Um, well, absolutely, I think they can be overcome. And I think that we should also be engaging with cultivated meat and cellular agriculture in the real world as we find it today as one of the most promising means to um, to make the world better for animals. So again, this comes with sets of challenges. Some of them are very similar to those I, I elucidated in the previous slide. But I think one that's really interesting from our perspective, from a kind of animal law, animal politics, animal ethics perspective, is the question of where are the animals? Where do animals fit in here? And when it comes to cultivated meat, unlike, I should say, other forms of cellular agriculture, at the moment, for many meats, not all, so fish, fish is not the case, because we have immortal cell lines um, for fish, but uh, for, say, beef or pork or chicken, we need animals as, quote unquote, donors. So cultivated meat takes animal cells and it grows those cells out or outside of the animal to produce meat, to produce something that is chemically, materially, culinarily indistinguishable from slaughter based meat, at least in theory. But of course, that needs animals to start the process. And there's a range of different models of how these animals might find a home. And let me again stress, I think. The fact that these animals might find a home is a good thing. I think it could be a good thing that this system continues to need animals because it continues to bring animals into our society, find a place for them um, and allow people to work with them in those ways that they find valuable. Pig in the backyard model says, well, we keep a pig in our backyard or another animal in our backyard. We occasionally take a few cells, use a nifty kitchen gadget to turn those cells into meat. A mail order cells model says something like, well, the animals are kept well away from humans, right? Um, and we we try to bring them, we try to have immortal cell lines wherever possible. So it's a kind of animal free model. A model I explore and I use to kind of complement these is the animal worker model. I say maybe animals are workers. They should be uh, protected by workers' rights. This is something, incidentally, I borrow very strongly from the legal literature. Some of you may know Charlotte Blattner's work, but also from the political philosophical literature. And if we protect these animals with workers' rights, maybe they could be colleagues of farmers. They get a wage, they get retirement, they get union representation. In short, they get protection. So this is a food system, a farming system that continues to use animals, but uses them in a way that respects their rights. It finds them a home in our society. And don't forget milk, don't forget eggs, right? Cultiv uh, cellular agriculture uses slightly different technologies to create these things, but they're already here. Right. If you visit the United States, you can purchase ice cream, you can purchase cake mixes, you can purchase uh, milk that is created outside of a cow. And I think that's marvellous. I will very quickly say, just to finish with, well, if we can protect animals with workers rights, why stop at cultivated meat? OK, we certainly can't have meat. We can't have slaughterhouses. You know, killing an animal is inconsistent with respecting their rights in normal circumstances. But maybe we could work with these animals in some way. Could we have, for example, a rights respecting egg farm? Some of you may know that I've defended the institution of backyard chickens in the past. I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with keeping a few chickens in our back garden and harvesting their eggs, as long as the chickens are welcomed as members of our family. OK, there's nothing wrong with co-living with animals and deriving some benefit from those animals as long as they are respected. And I think we could scale that up using this institution of workers' rights to produce eggs. Now, they wouldn't be cheap eggs, but if people value eggs and if people value this kind of work, as we know people do, they might be willing to pay for it. So here's my bold proposal. We should be ready to explore the prospect of non-vegan food systems insofar as they're compatible with animal rights, we should be ready to permit them, right? We shouldn't prevent the, we shouldn't use the coercive power of the law to prevent people from acquiring food in these respectful ways. And 
if they can overcome problems with a plant-based food system, we should be ready to endorse them. What endorsing means, uh, I leave as an open question right now, but using the power of the state to support, to endorse, to champion these food systems, whether that's through subsidies, through education, through training, and so forth. But remember, this is the work of ideal theory. Nothing I have said, nothing I will ever say, I don't think, will say that we shouldn't be vegan here and now. Or if we shouldn't be vegan, it should be only in very particular circumstances. I'm certainly not supporting the existing meat industry. I'm certainly not supporting the existing egg or milk industry. But I do think that when we're designing uh, just future societies, just future states, just future food systems, we should be ready to explore, permit, and even endorse non-vegan systems. Okay, thank you very much.